Welcome to another edition of Chicago Crossing Model Railroad at the Bench. It's me, Eric, here with you. It's the underside of the layout. You've been seeing that for a little while. Still a few more things to do underneath here. And today what I've devoted uh, the majority of my time working on the layout to is uh, power management. You know, I don't know how much all of us think about power management, uh, particularly for small layouts where space is scarce. You know, there are a couple of strategies off the cuff that anybody can use. Number one is to mount power strips uh, on the sort of horizontal beams on the sides or middle of a layout. The other is simply to have whatever, you know, power supplies uh, you are using elsewhere and to just run the variety of, of different uh, cords up into the layout wherever they may go. Chicago Crossing as built used essentially both of these approaches. On the one hand, there were power strips and power switches and other things actually mounted underneath the layout. And at the same time, that was insufficient for all of the power uh, running to and from wall outlets. And so therefore I had power strips sitting on the floor on both sides of the layout on one side to accommodate DCC, on the other side to accommodate a whole bunch of other stuff. And so what that led to is really a chronic lack of real estate underneath the layout that could be better used for wiring, for uh, circuit boards and uh, terminal blocks and all sorts of things like that. And number two, it just contributed to a general disorganization that was uh, really a feature of the underside of this layout for a long period of time. So. When I was redesigning the uh, wiring for Chicago Crossing, I wanted to do better and set a good standard for how power is managed on the layout. Um, you've heard before and I've mentioned before, there are uh, multiple buses, exactly four different uh, power buses on Chicago Crossing. Now what that could mean is that there are four different sets of wires or cables running uh, to and from the layout in order to power all of those. So the solution I came up with is basically to use a quick release system with a uh, multi-conductor wire. In this case, I've got a 10 pin connector that runs to uh, an eight pin cable and that's fine. Uh, this basically allows for expansion. If I run another bus, I've already got the 10 pin setup over here so I can just expand as needed. But what this means is essentially there is one cable and one cable only that runs from the layout carrying all of the different power sources necessary to a centralized location where power can be adjudicated. So what I'll do is I'll take you through the process of, of putting this uh, together and getting this onto the layout. It's really not all that difficult. These are components that one can find on Amazon and I'll include the links to what these are uh, in the shopping list. Nothing here is particularly expensive. And mostly it just can, it requires a little bit of elbow grease in terms of soldering connections uh, between the uh, cable itself and the quick release. But you know, if I ever wanna move this out and take it to a model railroad show or something like that to show it in public, uh, I can easily disconnect the layout. I've got one cable to take with, one power supply module to take with, and one layout to take with, and that's really it. So for me, this is a great standard to set for my layout in terms of how to simplify power management and how to keep everything centralized and simple. Maybe it's something that interests you as well. So let's take a look at how it got done. Here what you're seeing is the disassembled end of the bulkhead connector that attaches to the cable. What I'm doing right now is adding a very small amount of flux using a micro applicator to the solder pans that will accept the wires. This is to help the solder flow down into these pans, uh, leaving them tinned and ready to uh, accept a wire. Next up, time to actually do the soldering. Apologies in advance, there's not a lot of good shooting angles where my hand isn't sort of in the way. But what you can see here is that I'm heating up the solder pan with my soldering iron and then I'm going to flow down uh, some solder into that pan. It solidifies, and now what we have is a tinned solder pan ready to accept uh, one of the eight conductors that will be coming from the cable. Uh, 
Next up, it's time to do the soldering. In this case, what I do is I pre-tin every wire in addition to pre-tinning the solder pans. This makes sure that there's good solder on solder connection. And what I'm doing at this point is pressing down on the wire in order to uh, fuse the solder together. Now, there are variants on this approach because uh, I didn't always find that the soldering iron was easily able to connect the two cables. In those rare cases here, what I did is actually just add a little bit more solder. But it's pretty easy to actually visualize the solder melting and re-adhering the, between the wire and the solder pan. And that's just what I kept my eye out for. Another good fusion there. An important point is to start from the bottom and work your way up. And that's simply because the shape of the solder pans makes it much more difficult to go in the reverse order. Here you can see me tinning the wire in advance of placing it into the solder pan. Once again, just trying to get solder onto each individual uh, component here. Here's a shot of adding just a little bit of flux to the tinned cable and the tin solder pan before adding the soldering iron. And in this case, what I've elected to do is the variant on the technique where I actually add a little bit of additional solder just to help the wire and the solder pan to adhere together. Now it's time to reassemble the cable. As you can see, there's a nice metal hood there. So once again, it's a little bit redundant to add the uh, shrink tubing onto the individual conductors. This is actually a weatherproof system. What you can see here is essentially a large rubber, uh, rubberized adapter that helps to keep water out of that connection. Now, Chicago Crossing isn't going to necessarily be sitting in Chicago weather, but nonetheless, it's just part of the system and it's a nice robust one too. The last step is simply to put the clamp in place that holds everything together. It's a pretty tough looking cable there. <laughs> Do that one more time and it's a complete cable. So here, here what you can see is the connection that will actually go onto the layout itself. And the methodology is precisely the same as it is for the cable. Once again, filling the solder pans with solder to tin them. It's really kind of a mellow and relaxing process, this whole thing. You know, repetition is just one of those things that sometimes can feel kind of relaxing. There we go. Another pan tinned and yet another. It's an easy way to eat up an afternoon. Not as if I don't have a lot that I could be doing, but you know, this is my hobby. It's my relaxation. No doubt it's yours too. Stuff like this can really help. Next up, just taking a little bit of rubbing alcohol, that is isopropanol for you chemistry folks, and removing any uh, resin flux that might still be left on those pans. I do this uh, after every soldering step. I just didn't show it for the cable. And just as before, it's time to add the wires. And once again, you can see that uh, I am actually helping things along by adding a little bit more solder onto the wires. I did find that was uh, quite helpful, um, especially in corners where I couldn't quite see if the solder had melted together. Once again, repetition, progress, and colorful wires. <laughs> Makes for a great Saturday. Something that's important to note is that the order of the wiring here is absolutely essential. It's important that you write down before you actually do this uh, what conductor goes into what terminal. And it's really easy as a reminder. What you can see here is that each of those terminals has a number. The other important thing to note is that the cable side and the side that actually goes on the layout are essentially mirror images of each other. 
And so what that means is, in this case, I'm soldering everything in exactly the opposite order as I soldered them for the ends of the cable. And for that reason, I kept the sheet of paper that I'd written down the numeric order of each of these wires so that I could refer to it continuously throughout this process. The last thing I want to do is try to think deeply on it or you know, use my memory. It's best just to have the sheet written down so you know. You don't need to be connecting wires in random order. Now, since this component actually is exposed underneath the layout and doesn't have a metal shroud, I am actually placing shrink tubing onto the solder joints to help protect them. I used a 1 and 3 8 inch hole saw to drill the hole in order to accept this adapter. I had removed the rubberized gasket with the uh, adapter cover that you see there while I was soldering, simply to keep it out of the way, especially when working with hot temperatures. And now I'm adding Wago wire nuts to each of the wire ends coming off of this adapter. Just like with switches, here I'm looking for a secure, although not necessarily a permanent attachment between this uh, bulkhead connector and the rest of the wires on the layout bus. Especially before I've tested anything, it makes sense not to have a permanent joint. But even after, these are pretty secure. Now what I'm doing after having cut away some of the excess wire is basically trimming away the ends using a, a wire trimmer in order to connect into the other side of these Wago wire nuts. It's a satisfying process to be sure. At last, we're getting connected. <laughs> and the last one. This definitely calls for a little bit of wire management and that's why uh, after I made this video, I made those plastic standoffs that you saw. So after taking off the plastic cover, it's time to connect the cable. This is a wonderfully secure connection. First off, the cable has uh, pins on it that ensure that it only goes in in the correct orientation. And then you have this screw on clamp in order to secure everything together in a bulletproof way. I absolutely love that. And of course, now there's one wire running all four buses to the layout. We still have to work on the actual power supply. That'll come in a following video. But here you go, four buses, one cable, everything connected and everything secure. I'm really happy with this one. All right, hope to see you next time. Take care.